Chapter 8. Daylight crept through the trees some hours later, and Cade had no more tears to shed. In the night, a soft fog had invaded the woods. The trees and underbrush took on a surreal and foreign air in the whitened light. The world became washed out, all colours deviating towards grey. The wind gave the branches and leaves an uneasy disposition, and the breeze lent the air a Christmas that could almost be tasted. Cade stood slowly, unsteady. The cold of the night had sunk deep into him, and he shook violently. Unknowingly, he made for the wagon back on the road. Vague awareness pointed him back towards the bolts of cloth and the warmth they offered, where conscious thought could offer nothing but the sense that the biting cold was deserved. The road was crusted over with a thin layer of frost that cracked underfoot. As Cade returned to the scene, his thoughts returned again to Tommen, to Mirren, and her insistence that Cade be killed. She had cooked for him, tussled his hair when he had turned up too late in the day to risk the road back to his home, cleaned scraped knees and patched torn clothes, and anger joined Cade's growing list of warring emotions. She had treated him like a son. She told him that he always had a place by their hearth. Were they just vague niceties? Empty words? Was it this easy to disown someone? And Sandus? No. Too painful. Reaching the wagon, he selected a thick blanket of a dyed blue wool and threw it over his shoulders. It was itchy and smelled very faintly of the dye, but a ball walk to the cutting wind brought him near instant warmth. Proceeding past the wagon, Cade approached the cart he and Emmon had brought from home. He tried to keep his gaze from alighting on the cooling body of Sasha, still strapped to the drawer of the cart. Now what? Thought pervaded the river of emotions. I just... Wait for the speaker to come back? Wait here to die? Give them what they want? Cade found his mouth twisting into a grimace. It's my grander who's dead. My life ruined. Fighting off a veer that would have killed us all if given the slightest chance, and I'm supposed to just sit down and die? He wouldn't give them that. But where would he go? What could he do? Home? It was all he could think to do. He couldn't continue to Ararat. He'd just meet the Arnvart all the sooner. So Nierton was the only option. He was passing home if he went that way anyway. So he could collect some supplies and try to get to Nierton. Making it there before dark was possible, but he couldn't linger. Cade stared out at the road home. Fog obscured it such that it became an empty grey portal into a confusing life. Though he knew that not even that was possible if he stayed here. Chapter 9 Cade arrived home close to midday. The rising sun had driven away the fog if not the chill. It seemed that even this would be short-lived, as ominous-looking clouds washed in from the highland peaks in the west, bringing with them a strong wind that cut through the thick woolen blanket that Cain had salvaged from the wagon. The sunlight felt like a lie, a pretense of warmth that had no intention of being backed up. The hard-packed earth of the high road abruptly gave way to the sparse green trail of grass leading to Cade's home. The sight of it felt strange. He had left barely a day ago, it was unchanged. Not a clump of earth on the barely raised roof had shifted. No rivets of water had appeared in the drive. The wood of the shutters hadn't faded in the sun, and the grass hadn't encroached on the barn. Completely unchanged. Yet, everything was different. Cade shoved open the stern wooden door. It protested slightly due to its weight, but unlatched as it was, it shifted nonetheless. Legs feeling like leaden weights, he made his way down the ramp. Twin rows of shelves dug into the earthen walls of the ramp held small figurines carved by Emmon's hand. Cade felt the eyes of each carving on him as he passed. A wave of melancholy descended upon him as he reached the main room. Everything was a reminder. A soft, heavily padded chair with a colourful blanket draped over it by the fireplace. An unfinished wicker basket. A hand-woven pair of curtains, depicting an amateur's attempt at a sunrise, provided Emmon's room with a measure of privacy. A small nook where they prepared meals held a modest line of clay plates, bowls and cups. Cade was intimately aware of which were Emmon's favourites. I'm so sorry, Granda. Cade rushed ahead, into his room, and away from the memories, being sure to pull the curtain closed behind himself. From a trunk beneath the bed, Cade sought out a second cloak. Not as hefty as the one left in the cart, but better than nothing. After throwing the cloak around himself, he lay the wool blanket out. He piled in the last of his clothes and rolled it up. The blanket formed a long, thin bundle that he slung over his shoulder and tied in the front. Cade wanted to add some food, 
but there was nothing left. All they had was added to the pack in the cart. He felt he had all that he could bring. Certainly not all that was needed, but it was all that was left. He came up short as he reached the main room once again. Thought hit him like a falling tree. He would likely not see this place again. His home. It had felt like it had when he packed the day before. A preparation for a short trip. A brief goodbye to his childhood home. A quick adventure with the promise of eventual return. But not now. The shock of it filled him with a crushing pain in his chest. That deep ache that had become too familiar of late. Breaths came quick and panicked, and one last furtive glance to the home that had protected him for 16 years was all that he could manage. Kate hiked the bundle of clothes tied around his shoulders and made for the ramp at a pace barely shy of running. Weak sunlight, slowly being bullied into submission by darkening clouds, cast a long shadow down the ramp into Kate's home. Cade raised eyes to meet a silhouette blocking both the light and the entryway. Farlan, it seemed, had made much better time than he had. Oh, I do like how that chapter ends. <laughs> um, so, when when this... So, okay, firstly, these two chapters are combined. Um, th- these were incredibly short chapters, and so... Yeah, rather than making two videos, I thought this is where it's sort of at the point where I really must just combine them. Uh, and these, I think, would probably work as a broken apart chapter, it, depending on how much I elaborate on each of them. One thing I noticed is that, so this is where, you know, previously I had been working on descriptions and it, it became sort of embarrassingly apparent that, like, this is this is the moment where I had just, you know, gone to Google and Googled, how do you describe things in a book? And, you know, Im- immediately, you know, following that, the next chapter is far too, like, flowery and, uh, like, you know, something I read about was, like, you know, when you're describing something, try and consider the fact that you've got, you know, different senses. How does how do things taste? How do they sound? How do they smell? How, uh, not just what they look like. And then the very first description is, like, no, the breeze had a crispness that could almost be tasted, which is just like obviously the worst possible thing I could have written. Uh, so rather embarrassing, but you live and you learn. Um, so yeah, that that will obviously descriptors will have to be rewritten so that it's not so crap. Some some of it I think is cool. There's a big part in here that needs to be fixed because there's no mention of the fact that the horse Sasha is killed, and so in this moment it would be like, why doesn't Cade? take the horse back so either i need to write in that the family takes sasha and the cart which they probably would uh considering their wagons destroyed and bernard is dead uh they'd probably just take sasha because you know why would they leave it for Cade? or i need to write that sasha gets killed by the uh, russian doll um not ent- entirely sure about um Cade's motivations as well um there's a bit where it's it's sort of like what do i do now wait for the speaker and uh uh, just wait here to die and then you know it's my grand uh, it's my life that got ruined and I'm supposed to, you know I was fighting off a veer that would have killed all of us and I'm just supposed to sit down and die and he's sort of angry about it but up until now he's only been self-loathing so I don't know if it's it's sort of I don't know if his motivation there is kind of crap or if just my characterization of him isn't very strong which obviously is going to be true because I'm a new writer but yeah, not sure if, if I should, <sighs> not sure how to go about that whole bit. I don't know if it works or not. I don't, yeah, none of this is something I'm confident with. Um, and I don't even really know, I don't know where to start and I don't even know if I need to start on some, like, yeah. So don't know anything about that. <laughs> the next bit is like, um, uh, I do like the, the way I describe the weather in the next bit, like sunlight being beaten into submission or... Um, you know, the rising sun had uh, driven away the fog, if not the chill. It seemed that even this would be short-lived as ominous-looking clouds washed in from the highland peaks in the west, bringing with them a strong wind that cut through the thick woolen blanket that Cain has salvaged from the wagon. Like, I think that flows r- really nicely. Like, you know, it's describing the weather. It's describing how it is affecting Cade. The sunlight felt like a lie, a pretense of warmth that had no intention of being backed up is probably not right a pretense of warm that had no intention of being followed followed through or i don't know so, 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 something different there but i do like the idea of like the sunlight was a liar pretense of warmth because sometimes you know days are like that right like it's sunny as fuck and you're still freezing and you're like what the fuck <laughs> but this bit where it says um you know uh, 
the the wind coming down from the highland peaks in the west there have been there's obviously going to be massive continuity errors all through this section because i've got bits where i refer to like the the weather blowing in from one direction and then the other and when Cade leaves, he's heading north, or and then when I reference it the next time, he's heading east. The nearest town is in the west, and then it's in the south. Ge- ge- geographically, it's all up the shit, so continuity here needs to be completely reworked. That's going to be probably pretty late in the process, but I'm going to have to do some sort of mapping of the of the world, and that's going to be really hard just because I don't know how. I'm not really familiar with you know, do mountains form. Uh, you know how do, how do rivers form around mountains or whatever like I, I i got no idea like i don't know how the topography of a world is supposed to look so i'll have to yeah it, this is after looking into it like i i've been interested in fantasy maps for ages and and it's just i, I guess after looking into it, it not, nothing stuck i guess but yeah then he goes into the house that's uh, i like that i like the the reminders of things like i think it it gets you in Cade's head a little bit better than you previously have been, like everything being a reminder of him. Cade inti- intimately aware of which of the cups are Emmons' favourites. Like I thought that was a cool little touch. Ma- maybe, again, he doesn't need to be intimately aware of it. Like I can just point out that he knows which ones are his favourites, but, you know, whatever. And, yeah, you know, uh, packing is all fine. I do, I do like the the sensation that, like, he gets caught up in the idea that you know, he feels like he did yesterday. Like he's just packing. Um, he's just getting ready to go. And like he, he was overwhelmed by memories, but the house didn't feel any different. Like it didn't feel like any different to the, it did the previous day. But of course today is different because he's not going to be seeing this place again. And I, th- I think it was cool that that sort of took him aback a bit. And yeah, like I said at the start, I really like how this chapter ends. Like, it, uh, you know, th- this it, again, you know, might need to reword some things so that it doesn't sound so cringy maybe but i don't even know if it does like maybe it's just because i'm reading it out loud and everything sounds weird when you read it out loud but i don't know there's definitely some bits that could probably use some work but yeah um the bit where it's like you know uh weak sunlight slowly being bullied into submission by darkening clouds cast a long shadow down the ramp into Cade's home i don't know if it's clear that until like in that line it's not really clear that um because it goes on to say Cade raised eyes to meet a silhouette blocking both the light and the entryway. I think that's kind of cool as well. Um, Farland, it seemed, had made much better time than he had. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I, I quite like the way that ends. But anyway, um, so I hope you liked the video and I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.